Chapter 3. Shavid. The Shavid wagons were like nothing Fox had ever seen. Not the simple, sturdy carts that the caravan used, but tall, wide things, painted bright colours and hung with everything from feathers to bells to cookware, making them clank and jangle as they paraded through the square. They were more like rolling houses than anything, with shuttered windows along the sides and brightly painted back doors. Even the horses that pulled them drew the eye, with ribbons woven through their manes and jewelled baubles dangling from their harnesses. Fox had never seen so much colour. Rich reds and oranges, and blues so bright they made the sky look drab. There were colours he couldn't even name, colours that he could only dream about from father's stories. As he watched the Shavid come pouring out of their wagons, he rubbed his fingertips together, warming them slightly. These were colours so vibrant he wanted to reach out and touch every one of them, as though they might feel different than the colours in Thicker Valley. And the smells! As each wagon passed, Fox caught a whiff of something new and beautiful and confusing, something sharp and tangy from the wagon with the bright red door, then a series of flowery scents from the wagon with the green door and yellow shutters. The last wagon smelled entirely of leather, but it was the richest leather smell Fox had ever experienced. There was something soft about the scent that he couldn't quite figure out. The Shavid began setting up camp in an empty stretch at the western end of the square. Fox was amazed at how quickly and seamlessly they worked, almost like a dance. As he watched, three of the men began unfolding the sides of one of the wagons, transforming it into a small stage at the heart of their campsite. Two more wagons were parked on either side, and they too were in the process of being transformed. Women were pulling out bright patched awnings and long tables from the wagon sides, turning the wagons into selling booths before Fox's eyes. Hey! shouted Lai in his ear, and Fox jumped. He'd been drifting toward the Shavid camp without realising it. Now he stopped, tearing his eyes away from the whirlwind of colour. Yeah, he said sluggishly. I said come with me. I want to get some of my savings so I can buy something. She grabbed Fox by the arm and pulled him away, back to the five sides. Reluctantly, Fox allowed himself to be dragged against the tide of thickens, hurrying to get a closer look at the Shavid. Once inside the tavern, he followed Lai upstairs into the end of the hallway, where she and Boric shared one of the rooms. I've been saving up all winter so we could get some new things during the homecoming barter, but this is so much better, said Lai. She dropped to her knees in front of the fireplace and pried one of the bricks loose. In the hollow space beneath it, she stashed her most precious things. Money, her favourite doll from when she was younger, and a deep green hair ornament that she never wore. Fox saw the polished surface glint in the weak ember light and turned away. He'd seen Lai's treasure trove before, but that hair ornament was the only thing Lai had of her mother's. Looking at it always made Fox feel as if he were intruding on something very personal. Lai pocketed a handful of silver and replaced the brick. Let's go. Downstairs again, they were briefly held up by a group of Lai's cousins, all sent to help with the extra tavern business. Fox waited impatiently as Lai issued them their tasks, then finally grabbed hold of her shoulders and pushed her from behind. He steered her all the way to the Shavit camp like this as she laughed. A tall, broad-shouldered man was standing on the wagon stage, addressing the crowd. Fox dropped his grip on Lai, and they squeezed up to the front of the gathering to listen. And so, we thank you for welcoming us into your beautiful valley, the man was saying. His voice made Fox feel warm, as though he was sitting by the kitchen fire in the early morning. He was also dressed in the most remarkable clothes Fox had ever seen. His vest was bright red, and hung with rows of gold beads. Gold stitching winked from the cuffs of his deep blue shirt, and even his boots seemed to be patterned with golden leaves and feathers. Fox missed the next thing the man said. He was so fascinated by the colours. Suddenly, the man was bowing his way off stage, to be replaced by a handful of the other Shavid, all dressed in bright costumes and with masks tied to their faces. The Shavid players put on a show like nothing Fox had ever seen. It was a comic piece about one of the gods falling in love with a milkmaid, and it had the audience applauding and cheering riotously. By the time the players took their final bow, Fox was holding a stitch in his side from laughing so much. Then the Shavid welcomed the valley folk into their camp to trade and enjoy each other's company, Fox found himself shuffled forward by a mob trying to reach the seller's stalls, and he ducked quickly out of the way to avoid being trampled. Lai had vanished, presumably joining the eager crowd, and so Fox began to wander on his own, taking in the colours and smells with quiet delight. He caught glimpses of jewellery at the selling stalls, and leather masks that mimicked the ones he'd seen on stage. A handful of boys were buying ornately carved wooden swords from one of the players, 
and Fox couldn't figure out why. Thickens had no problem carving their own. What made these so special? For a moment he stopped to watch, frowning at two little boys as they squared off against each other in an empty patch of grass. And then, as they began play-fencing, Fox stared in amazement. Multicoloured sparks flew each time the wooden surfaces met, and Fox could swear he heard the clank of steel on steel. As the children fought clumsily, having no real idea how to fence, it almost seemed as though they were no longer dressed in their festival clothes. As Fox watched, he could swear that they were suddenly clad in chainmail and armour. The vision flickered and shifted as the combatants moved, but it was there. He turned away, staring around the rest of the camp excitedly. Tents as garishly bright as the wagons were being pitched all around him. They smelled of silk and fur and ink. Fox let his feet take over, wandering where they would with the rest of him simply along for the ride. He ducked behind the stage wagon, catching the briefest glimpse of flesh as some of the shavid began changing costumes for another play. He turned left, making his way deeper into the campsite. His feet took him past an open tent, almost a pavilion. Inside he saw a handful of thickened girls, including Kimmick, swaying their hips slowly in rhythm to a piper's tune. A tall, beautiful shavid woman in a long flowing skirt was directing them, seemingly teaching the girls a foreign dance. As Fox scanned the scene, he caught sight of the piper, dressed entirely in multicoloured patches. Fox watched him, sure for a moment that he'd seen a shower of sparks pouring from the pipe's end. But he blinked, and the vision was gone. The next performer he came across caught and held his attention for several minutes. A juggler, dressed in a costume of cream and gold, was entertaining a small group. He was juggling what first appeared to be solid golden baubles, the size of spring apples. But as Fox watched, some of the globes began to shift sizes in midair, changing from egg-sized to large as grapefruit in the blink of an eye. The audience clapped for him, and the juggler bowed dramatically, sweeping one arm behind him and continuing to juggle with his free hand. There, a deep-throated laugh somewhere to Fox's left, and the strum of a lute. It was the man in the red vest. Fox was sure of it. He turned, looking for the source. There, seated on a low stool in front of a short, round tent, was the broad-shouldered man who had made such an impression on Fox. He was surrounded by a handful of his company, all of whom were holding foreign instruments. The man himself was tuning a beautifully carved lute, the only instrument in the whole collection Fox recognised. He looked up when Fox approached. "'Welcome, young master,' said the man in that warm, rich voice. "'How can we help you today?' Fox looked over the small group. Two boys older than him, a man with a thick grey braid, and a woman whose dark red hair was cut so close Fox might have mistaken her for a man, if it wasn't for her form-fitting costume. They smelled of fresh soap and foreign spices and wood, and Fox felt a longing pulling at him that he could not explain. "'Look at the poor lad,' said the woman sympathetically. "'Speechless in sight of you, Rada.' The broad-shouldered man, Rada, laughed heartily. "'Well, there's no need for that,' he said. "'Come now, boy. What's your name?' Farak Foxglove. Fox. And what service might we offer you this fine afternoon, Master Fox? He shifted his instrument into playing position, and Fox marveled that hands so large could even hold the thing without snapping it into kindling. A song, a dance, a mythic tale of maidens and swords. Or is there a love ballad you'd like us to sing to a lady friend? asked one of the boys. We're best at the dancing tunes, though, said the other boy. And you really shouldn't ask for a tale, said the grey-haired man. Our resident storyteller is up at the front of camp somewhere, and this one here, he jerked his head toward Radha, has never been much with stories. Here now, said Radha in mock outrage. I'm better than you ever were, Otter. You embellish too much, Otter spat back. You turn what ought to be an end-of-night poem into an epic that drags through till the morning embers. Fox smiled as his nervousness melted slightly. Feeling somewhat bolder, he cut in before Radha had a chance to reply. Actually, he said, I was hoping to learn a little bit more about you, all of you, the Shavid. Now that he couldn't start it, he found he couldn't stop. It was as if he had to convey to them the longing, the need to know everything about them. It's just, we don't get many Shavid here, or any, ever. You're the first troop we've ever seen, that is to say, I've ever seen. And I know you travel the known world and you've seen so much more that there is to see than I can ever dream to and... Otter cut him off with a wave of his hand. 
All right, we get it, boy. He looked at Radha. For spirit's sake, tell him something before he wets himself. Radha chuckled and motioned for Fox to sit. He did so, waiting eagerly for Radha to set his instrument aside and begin speaking. There is a legend of the creation of the Shavid. He looked pointedly at Otter. I may not be a gifted storyteller, but there are some tales even I can spin to satisfaction. He took a breath and looked Fox in the eye. It begins, as all truly old stories do, with the start. In the beginning, Dream fell in love with spirit. Over time, their union would produce the gods, but firstborn were the elements. Earth called Shatsa, fire called Zaru, water called Ralith, and wind called Rin. Wind was the youngest of the four. She was blithe and vivacious, and told her father's spirit that she would never fall in love. When she finally did, as all women eventually do, her first kiss was legendary. It lasted one hundred years, and when it was over, it broke into one hundred pieces. And that was the beginning of the Shavid. Fox had heard stories before. There wasn't much else to do during the dead of winter. But this was nothing like the tales that were spun during the dark hours, when most of Thicker Valley would gather at the five sides and tell their favorite myths, or make up new poems and songs. Those nights were warm and comfortable, as you nestled in with your friends, and took turns telling your favorite parts of old legends. This, however, was something else entirely. From the very first words, Fox was whisked away to some place new. He could feel warmth on his face with the word fire, and his heart beat madly at the mention of love. And when Rin shared her first kiss, Fox felt an ice-cold pressure on his own lips. The Shavid are wanderers, Radha continued, following the wind, always moving from place to place, never setting down roots. They make their unofficial home in a town called Wanderlust. It is a place that exists only once a year and only for one purpose, to host the yearly gathering of the Shavid, a festival at summer's end dedicated to the celebration of their patron goddess and the birth of their people. There were tents, dozens of them, shimmering in Fox's vision, and the distant sound of a hundred wagons rolling through the woods toward the heart of Wanderlust, and brief, teasing scents flittering through the air, but disappearing before Fox could place any of them. The rest of the year, the Shavid travel in smaller groups or on their own. Their magical blessings are a reflection of Rin's own passions, music, dance, theater. But their true blessing is in their connection to the wind. It is Rin's voice to them, whispering in each ear and heart. The children of Rin answer to no master but the wind. When Radha bowed his head, the story at a close, Fox realized he hadn't been breathing. He took a deep breath of ice-cold air, pulling him from whatever spell the story had wrapped around him as Otter clapped Radha on the shoulder. Well done. See, you can practice brevity when you really want to. The musicians and Fox laughed, and the red-headed woman tugged playfully at the ear of one of the boys. Come on, we'd best start getting ready for the show. The group began to gather themselves up, straightening their costumes and checking that their instruments were in order. But Radha stayed put. He caught Fox's eye and hailed his gaze. You're still hungry for more, aren't you, boy? Fox nodded, and Radha seemed to scrutinize him closely for a moment, as if there was something about Fox that he couldn't quite put his finger on. Then he clapped his hands together and said, Well, Radha Southwick is nothing if not a people pleaser. He dramatically swept up his instrument again. Come now, ask me anything and I will be honored to oblige. What did it mean, the magic blessings? Powers, gifts, you know, the magic some people are born with. Fox blushed slightly. Of course, blessings. That's why he didn't recognize the term. Magic in Sylvester was extremely rare since the curse. Fox had never even heard of anyone in Thicker Valley being born with magic in over four generations. Oh, of course, he said to cover his embarrassment. Blessings. Well, the Shavid blessings are not like other magic. We don't usually appear from thin air, or read minds or walk in dreams. Our blessings live through our talents. Dancing, music, even sewing. Magic. And the music. The tall bard laughed. 
Well, of course, young master. For instance, I could make you see flowers. He plucked at a few strings, and a shimmering blanket of golden blossoms sprang to life at Fox's feet. A bright spring morning in a land where the snow falls only in December. He began to play a light-hearted tune, and it suddenly seemed to Fox that the ice beneath his feet had turned into lush green grass dotted with wildflowers. A sweet chirping chorus seemed to fill the air, and, just for a moment, the sun was warm on Fox's face. But as Fox reached out to touch an iridescent butterfly that was winging past, it all dissolved in a flurry of snow, and cold settled over him once more. Fox stared at the spot in front of him where the butterfly had been, barely registering the playful argument that had broken out between the musicians. It was only when Otter shouted, "'Whole forest of great white oaks, changing season! Now that was a performance!' that Fox came back to his senses. "'Maybe back then, but you couldn't pull that off these days, old man,' said one of the boys, and Otter smacked him on the back of the head. "'You all right, Fox?' asked Rada quietly as Otto and the boys continued to snipe at each other. Yeah, he said, shaking his head slightly. Just lost in thought, I guess. Well, said Rada, there are worse things to get lost in. When Fox didn't answer, he set aside his instrument. Why don't you head on back to the staging area? We've got a few more plans for tonight's festivities. You can watch from there. He leaned in closer and put a massive hand on Fox's shoulder. We're not going anywhere for a while, so don't you fret. I'm here if you have any more questions. Just go enjoy yourself. Fox nodded mutely and wound his way back through the Shavard camp in a haze. But he did not go back to the staging area. Instead, he slid through the crowd like a ghost, barely noticed. He wandered back to the five sides almost without thinking and flopped onto the bench across from Father. You look how I feel, said Father gruffly, shuffling through a stack of papers. How about we sneak another piece of pie later? Fox made a non-committal grunt and stared out the window without really seeing. The rest of the afternoon passed slowly, despite the constant shifting of crowds in and out of the tavern. Fox did his best to be helpful to Father, helping sort through trade goods and occasionally running back into the kitchen to grab them something to eat. But his mind kept drifting back to Rada's story. He could still feel the phantom goddess's ice-cold lips on his. When the Shavit came to the Five Sides for dinner... They put on a dazzling show. Rada played a rowdy song that made everyone cheer and throw coins at him, but Fox secretly longed for him to play the little tune with the butterflies again. Two of the girls did a southern country jig on one of the tables, and the juggler with the golden orbs finished the night with a spectacular act, appearing to juggle live, flaming birds. And they all sat and ate a hearty meal with the thickens, everyone laughing and swapping stories, just like in the dark hours of winter. Except this time... They weren't just stories. They were adventures. The Shavid were excited to learn the thickened tales, just as the valley folk were clamouring to hear the wanderer's stories. Everything was suddenly new and fresh, even the songs that Fox had heard a hundred times before. There was something there for him, with the Shavid. Something he needed. Something that he'd never known was missing, until now. <laughs>